Okay, we're going to look a little more closely at the revolutions of 1848. You had some readings last week and we began to discuss these, but I thought it would be helpful if we went and I could just highlight a couple of key points for you. Starting with uh, this illustration of how widespread the revolutions were in the 1830s as well as the big revolutionary year 1848. And just to point out two things about 1830, we see Poland attempt to have a, a revolution. They uh, or they do have a revolution. They attempt to break away from Russia, and this is a very uh, um, clear, hopefully, example of nationalism, where we have Poland with a very identifiable language and culture and religion that is different from Russia, which is in control of their country at that time. And despite the fact that that Poland is such an identifiable culture. They are so crushed, so brutally crushed in 1830 that we do not see revolution from them again in the 1800s. The other one to point out is Belgium, which if you recall from the 1815 Congress of Vienna, had been united into one empire, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, along with Holland and Luxembourg. And in 1830, Belgium breaks away and they form a liberal constitution, which at first makes the other countries a little nervous. This goes against the conventional ideology and, and the conservative ideology that was present in 1815 at the Congress of Vienna and restored all the old monarchs. But quickly they decide, okay, our plan A was to have this big country that would create a balance of power so that, you know, a French leader a la Napoleon could not come in and, and annex more territory like, you know, Napoleon had done in the past. The new thinking is, well, as long as Belgium always remains neutral, it probably would be nice to have this little neutral buffer of Belgium between France and the rest of Europe. And everybody just sort of agreed, okay, Belgium, have your liberal constitution, do your own thing, but you must always remain neutral. And everybody is bound by sort of respecting your neutrality. It's going to have World War I implications, so keep that in mind for the future. Now, 1848 revolution started by college students. They're the intellectuals. They're young. They get things moving. Workers, peasants join with them. Because we have the different social classes revolting in 1848, we do have conflicting ideologies. And, you know, we have our college students more liberal, wanting, you know, freedoms and individual rights. And then we have uh, some workers and peasants wanting a more radical approach. And of course, there's always the nationalistic goals of creating na nations based on, on ethnic culture and heritage. All across Europe, 1848 is the big year. Um, why? Just like the French Revolution, it's economically based. There are problems in the economy, starting with poor harvests leading to rising food prices and a government that had become very corrupt again. These monarchies were not getting the job done and people were very upset. The revolutions technically broke out first in Italy in 1848, but really it was the revolutions in France in 1848 that got the other countries to take notice and start revolutions of their own. And we're talking about you know other parts of Italy, Austria, Prussia, other parts of Germany, really all across Europe. And if you can take a look at, um, at these pictures here, one of the strategies that was really popular in the revolutions of 1848 was for the revolutionaries to make these um, you know, barricades in the streets and kind of cordon off different sections and take control of parts of the city first. And they would just bring out old furniture, uh, wagon wheels, you know, whatever they had, and block off certain parts. And it was a tactic that was fairly successful for a while anyway. Um, again, just to highlight all the different nationalities, one of the reasons why these weren't successful as we did have kind of internal divisions between the many different nationalities that make up Europe in the mid 1800s and they all really felt like they had their own needs and their own you know um, ideologies in a way and then lastly if we could just say you know one thing kind of the bottom line the revolts were short-lived, uh, the conservatives regained power, and the revolutionaries did not achieve their goals, but they did frighten rulers who later agreed to